All right, let's do this tonight. The first of two shows this week. And thank you for tuning in, everyone, to Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5. Presented by the Daspit Law Firm. John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. 713 call now. Daspitlaw.com. So, uh, boy, I'm looking forward to this one tonight. I was uh, very juiced today to get in here. Almost like overly anxious to get here and talk. We're streaming at ESPN975.com. You can hit me up on Twitter and Instagram uh, at Glenn Davis Sock at Soccer Matters GD. The call in number 713 780 3776 at 713 780 ESPN. Uh, by the way, like every show, throughout the night, we are going to take your testimony and on this simple question of what the World Cup coming to Houston means to you. So, um, whether you're a team mom, the mother of a soccer player, an ex-pro, uh, the head of a youth club, state who you are, come on and give me 30, 40 seconds why it's great for Houston. We're going to continue to play a lot of testimony that we have. Um, all right, so we've got uh, the Ivory Coast Triumph in the African Cup of Nations. we got the Bayern Munich beatdown courtesy of the Black and Reds of Leverkusen and a man named Javi, uh, Javi uh, by the way. Uh, Bayern lost again today uh, to uh, Lazio in Rome in the UEFA Champions League. Dynamo injury concerns. Kate Cowell continuing to impress Achivas. UEFA Champions League results, and as I mentioned, testimony from the Houston soccer community. So Ian Veery is a part of the Houston Liverpool supporters group, and Ian sent in this testimony. So uh, here's what Ian had to say about uh, the World Cup coming to Houston. The World Cup in Houston is going to be so exciting. Houston's such a metropolis of football and such an, it has such an international flavour to the city. The soccer clubs around here are just full of different cultures and backgrounds and that really is what mixes Houston's soccer scene so well. I cannot wait for the World Cup. It's going to be an amazing experience. Well, I know the passion uh, absolutely pours out of uh, Ian Very. He's a part of the Liverpool supporters group. Uh, that's Houston LFC, who's over Hugh O'Connor's Irish pub in the Marquee Entertainment Center. Uh, again, um, send me uh, 30, 40 second clips and we'll play them on the air here. Because we want to hear from you what it means to you. And there's been really good takes. Uh, I like that word, the use of metropolis. A very, very good word. Um, okay, let's get into the African Cup of Nations. Now, I know many of you probably did not watch it. Um, if you didn't, it's kind of too bad. It's on being sports, so a lot of people don't get that. But essentially, it's the World Cup of the continent of Africa. If you didn't follow it, you missed out. And again, I urge you to check out other competitions like this. The drama, the quality, the world-class players, sophisticated tactics and growing national pride. The national pride is beautiful to watch from the African countries. Uh, it, it, it's just so explosive. I mean, it's like, it's like 4th of July blown up in the sky. It's incredible. Crazy cool team names. Now check this about the African Cup of Nations teams and the national teams of the continent of Africa. Team names like this. And by the way, Guillermo, I want you to tell me which one you like the best. But here's just a few of them. Super Eagles, Nigeria. Elephants, Ivory Coast. Indomitable Lions, Cameroon. Bafana Bafana, South Africa. Leopards, Black Stars, Pharaohs, the Lions of Taranga, Mambas. I mean, these, are, these have to be the best national team nicknames going unless somebody out there can give me a better one. 713-780-3776. All right, the host nation, the Ivory Coast, defeats the Super Eagles of Nigeria to win this title. Now, let me just say, these were two teams that grew into the tournament, and this is something that we often see. Remember, it's a couple-week tournament. Uh, things change very quickly, almost like the weather. But we often see this. Teams grow in confidence, find their game, uh, enjoy specific good fortune. A singular player may change the complexion of a team. A coach makes a decision to alter his tactics. 
and all of a sudden you grow a few inches and you're plowing through the tournament. Now, the Ivory Coast remarkably gets to the final in this after being pathetic and not very good as the host nation in the group stage. They're essentially resigned to the fact that they are not advancing. And then Ghana has an implosion, conceding two late goals against Mozambique. Out they go. Uh, Black Stars fans are going crazy, super upset that Ghana is out. And as the worst third-place team, in goes the Ivory Coast as the host nation. And the next thing you know, they get a second chance, and on they go. And by the way, they had fired their coach in the first round um, in that, which made it even more interesting because Immerse uh, Faye became the coach of the team which, uh, after firing uh, Jean-Louis Gasset, Immerse Fay came in. So they only advanced as the host nation after Ghana crashed and burned. Um, Both of these teams did this. Um, The Ivory Coast won 2-1 over Nigeria in the group phases. uh, Or no, they won... No, I'm sorry. They won in the final 2-1 over Nigeria after being down 1-0. 38th minute, Nigeria go up 1-0 off a corner. William Trost Ikang backs up, then gets a run at a second ball, and that's the first goal of the final, 38th minute. Back from suspension, they put him straight back into the line to take it. Curls it towards the near post. Flick on from Chukwezi. Trostek goal! Goal! Goal, Nigeria! Trostek Kong's third of the tournament. Strong header from a corner, and the Super Eagles are in the lead. Now, Trusta Kong, by the way, was headed to being, not that he, he isn't still, I mean, he's had an outstanding tournament, but if they had won, there would have been a lot more focus uh, on William Trusta Kong. Uh, very solid at the back, uh, scores that goal. Uh, they had only conceded two goals going into this tournament. So if you go back and look at that play, he, the second ball comes out. He actually backs up and then gets a five-yard run at it. So he's going to lick anybody in the air at that point, and he does. So it's 1-0 Nigeria. They're set up to play counterattacking football at this point with Victor Oshiman and Ademola Lukman. Uh, Lukman has, I think, three goals in the tournament. They had only conceded twice, as I mentioned. Both these guys up front are pressing runners. Lukman is a dribbler. They got five across the back. It's very clear what their tactical plan is here. Um, And in a lot of ways, they are conceding the ball, obviously, to the Ivory Coast. But the Ivory Coast is playing the football and trying to win the game. So 1-0 at the half. Super Eagles up. Things are good for them at that point. 62nd minute, the Ivory Coast breakthrough. Frank Kessie, who had an outstanding tournament, um, jumping out of midfield in this game, scores off a corner kick delivery from Adingra. Adingra will take the corner. The crowd are on their feet. Here it comes. Nabali, back post chance, goal! Frank Kessier! Cote d'Ivoire are back in the game. So Kessier scores. Um, Ivory Coast in midfield, uh, th- there's a lot of credit that has to go to Seiko Fofana and Seri because these two guys kind of dictated the tempo, held it down there. It allowed Kessie to jump into the attack. He tried to play off Holler in the middle. He tried to play off Gradell. Um, but, man, this guy, I mean, I don't know if he had three lungs or what, Frank Kessier, but he scores the equalizer. It's fitting he gets it. And then Sebastian Holler scores the winner in the 81st minute for the Ivory Coast. Conan out wide, Adingra to attack Aina again, Adingra, can he cross, it's a great ball, it's a goal! So, Sebastian Haller scores in the 81st minute, that ends up being the game-winning goal. By the way, this is a guy that two years ago was diagnosed and then went on to be testicular cancer. Plays at Borussia Dortmund, did not play uh, in the group stages due to the ankle injury he had in the tournament. So he, so he entered the tournament in the knockout stage. So again... Here's an example of how things can change in tournament play. Um, and he, you know, he scores a game-winning goal in the African Cup of Nations final. He'll probably never have to pay for a meal or drink again in the Ivory Coast. 62% of the possession in favor of the Ivory Coast, 18-5 to 5 in shots, 
Total of 33 fouls, uh, which did kind of chop the game up at times. Check this out. Yahia Fafana in goal did not make a save for the Ivory Coast. Pretty remarkable when Victor Osterman and Adamola Lukman are up front. So Nigeria did not have a shot on goal, except for the header. Ivory Coast win their third African Cup of Nations. They were dead and buried in the group stages, and they win it uh, in very exciting style. And I'll tell you, um, this was a great watch on Sunday. I had a wonderful time watching this. Eddie Robinson, my former partner on TV, came over. We watched. Uh, he got there for the second half, and then we watched the Super Bowl. It was a great Sunday. Super Bowl was great, too. Um, so I would suggest in the future, African Cup of Nations, um, some great stuff. Now, to relate that to what we have coming, on, uh, coming up here in the summer, we've got the Copa America, which is normally played in South America. It's for the continental sort of championship of South America or the South American World Cup, if we want to compare it. And it's always amazing to watch it down there simply because of, you know, the aesthetics of where some of these stadiums are. They're tucked into mountains. They're at altitude. They're legendary stadiums where World Cups have been won. But it's going to be in the United States. And we all know why, because it's going to be monetized here like it can't be in South America. And this is why the U.S. is going to continue to get lots of events and confederations are going to decide that, oh, it's, you know, even though it's our continental tournament, we're going to move it to the U.S. because there's going to be more dollars to be gained uh, that can never be gained in South America. So this is a trend that uh, began, will continue, and um, pretty amazing that it's going to be here. Now, we have it here in Houston June 22nd, we got Mexico, Jamaica. June 24th, we have Colombia and Paraguay. And July 4th, we have a quarterfinal, which if Lionel Messi and Argentina win their group, uh, they will come back to Houston. They've been here before. And, um, boy, that would be a nice little uh, caveat for us to get uh, at that point. Um, and, by the way, the U.S. will play Colombia in a warm-up match before the Copa America earlier in June. That's something that's come out. Also, Got the CONCACAF Women's Gold Cup coming up. Now, look, you want to watch some interesting play. February 22nd, 25th, and 28th, Shell Energy Stadium. Costa Rica, Paraguay, Canada, all involved in this. Um, great opportunity to see the development of women's soccer in these countries. And believe me, it's developing, and it's getting to a next level. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. By the way, you're going to note with my music here tonight, and when I think of music, I think of Cactus. That's where tomorrow night, the Dynamo unveiling of the New Jersey. I guess it's going to be purple, right? I mean, that's everything that's out there, or is it a sleight of hand? What do you think, Guillermo? Do you think it's going to be a purple jersey? I mean, there's actually been pictures on Twitter. No official release by the Houston Dynamo, but there's been several pictures of a purple jersey. Yeah, no, I saw that. That's why I was questioning. I was wondering, could this be a little sleight of hand here? I think it could. So you're saying it, it could come out and not be a purple jersey? I think it could be anything, but I, I do think it's going to end up being purple, honestly. Okay, there it is. Well, Dynamo fam, what do you think of a purple jersey? 713-780-3776. Purple's a cool color. 713-780-3776. Uh, we got a lot to talk about here tonight. Jim Teachens, fantastic goalkeeper from the St. Louis area. Uh, back in 1984, when I was on the Houston Dynamos and we were playing for the USL League Championship against Fort Lauderdale, he was a goalkeeper for Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's a great best of three series. Um, I never forget it. Um, a lot of people probably have at this point, but but I don't forget it. Neither do a lot of people who play in the game. But this was at Lockhart Stadium, which is now the inner Miami home. Back then, it was just bleachers around the field. Um, you know, tall bleachers, but it was a great environment. Jim has a book called Saves. Um, he's going to be on in the last segment. And let me tell you, uh, you want to put your life in perspective. When you hear what this man and his family have gone through, um, 
it will ground you very, very quickly. And I don't want to spill the beans here. But he's got a book out called Saves, and it's actually not really a soccer book, he told me. It's more about um, medical issues, genetics, family, challenges, support, all these amazing things. All right, we'll take a break here. Uh, don't forget, YouTube, Soccer Matters. Please go over there, subscribe. X and in Instagram, at Glenn Davis Sox, Soccer Matters GD, glendavissoccer.com. We love the subscriptions, the likes, the follows, the comments, calls, all of this stuff. This is Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Brought to you by the Daspit Law Firm. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Glenn Davis. This is Lazio's biggest penalty of the season. Immobile beats Neuer. Lazio 1, Bayern Munich 0. Listen to that Roman noise. Boy, that's a tough week for Bayern Munich after getting slashed and burned by Leverkusen and Javi Alonso 3 0. They lose today at Lazio. So something missing there right now. Um, there's no question. They don't look confident. Harry Kane, Kane did not look confident up front. It's definitely something sputtering there at Bayern Munich, which I think have won the Bundesliga title 11 times in a row. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Soccer Matters ESPN 97.5 brought to you by John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. DaspitLaw.com. 713-CALL-NOW. Um, Daspit Law Firm. Uh, ready to handle and work your case 24-7. 713 call now. That song, uh, Owner of a Lonely Heart, that's for, well, people that might not have the Valentine tonight, right? It's a great yes song, uh, one that's pretty famous uh, that many people will have known. Um, but we have a couple of other good music selections here tonight. I think my buddy Quinn at Cactus will be happy with some of the selections tonight. There are uh, some different ones. Um, and don't forget, tomorrow night, that's where... Uh, the uh, jersey unveiling will be tomorrow. And uh, Cactus Music, the best in vinyl selection, new and used, CDs, books, everything music. Um, for those, I, I want to make sure that I'm not uh, providing wrong information here. I think this is a, an invite-only event for season ticket holders. But for any season ticket holders who are going to that event tomorrow, that's Houston's oldest independent music store for 40 years. But... Um, it's a real treat going in there. It's, it's, it's a very cool place, uh, especially if you're a big, big music lover. Uh, Hugh O'Connor's Pub, I-10 Marquee Entertainment Center. Daily specials, whiskey and beer offerings uh, are off the charts. Great traditional English pub food, bangers and mash, fish and chips, shepherd's pie. Say hello to Goose and David. The place is pristine. Great spot for all your sports watching. And as I mentioned, the home of Houston LFC supporters groups. Um, LamontBrands.com. We're going to get a red T-shirt for you soon. So Houston LFC, U of H. Uh, if you want a red version, Soccer Matters T-shirts and hats to benefit the 501C charity, the Snowdrop Foundation. Okay, so today we had uh, Lazio, uh, as we heard there, 1-0 over Bayern Munich. Uh, PSG, 2-1 over Real Sociedad today. Kylian Mbappe scoring the opener in the 58th. This would ultimately be the game winner. Keep it close. Delivered by Dembele. Marquinhos is here to meet it. And Mbappe arrives at the back post. And he's done it again. And the reason why you cannot give this man that much space. So that 2-0 uh, PSG. You know, Guillermo, when everybody's contemplating now uh, Mbappe to Real Madrid and apparently PSG is going to offer him $200 million to stay, and then you're thinking, well, he already got Vinicius Jr. there. Uh, what do you think of that? I mean, how's he going to fit in there? I mean, can you imagine Vinicius Jr. and Mbappe with that explosiveness, that dribbling ability, that pace, the variety of ways they can beat you? I can't imagine it. I definitely don't want to see it happen <laughs> as a Barca fan myself. But I feel like these things are still up in the air because I've seen he's going to Madrid. I've seen he's going to Arsenal. Like I've seen, I've seen different things. So honestly, until things happen, I really like to keep my thoughts to myself because 
couple years back when he was set on going to Madrid. Everybody was convinced he ended up staying. So I guess we'll see what happens. Hey, by the way, everybody thought the World Cup, including me, was coming to uh, up in Dallas to Jerry Jones's palace, and we got uh, we got back to it at the end of that one. Uh, MetLife gets it in New Jersey. Of course, all my New Jersey friends are very, very happy about that. 713-780-3776. What's on your soccer mind tonight? 713-780-3776. Um, okay, so here's um, a piece of footage that I thought was was pretty interesting here because you know I was having a discussion about player development and the way things have gone in the past to where we are now. And, and obviously, youth soccer player development has um, changed in a lot of different ways. And I pulled some sound uh, from a variety of places. Here's an audio uh, soundbite 21. This is on winning versus development in player development. Technically, tactically, physically, mentally. That's your main responsibility. Of course, you have a match on Saturday. But it, the match is more a tool to, yeah, like what we did, for example, with De Ligt. He played the European final last year against Manchester United. Go, uh, he played a good match. 17-year-old central defender. But we said, okay, central defense is too easy for him in the youth. Put him on the midfield. Yeah, and then the coach says, yeah, but he's a central defender. Uh, he can prevent the, the, the opponent from scoring. That's important for the results. Yeah, but it's important for him to improve his speed of action. These kind of decisions, you start to think about them when your responsibility changes from winning to development. Yeah, and that's your responsibility as a youth coach. Uh, it's not just to park some kid somewhere uh, because you're going to win a lot of soccer matches that nobody's ever going to remember. Now, in this case, he's talking about DeLitt, who was playing as a center back. So they move him into midfield. And so you think of that just from a very basic standpoint. You're receiving a ball in midfield. You have pressure coming from the right, left, behind, in front of you. It's a completely different, dare I say it, ecosystem, right? Whereas if you're a center back, the entire game is in front of you for large portions of matches. So at a young age, why wouldn't you, for the benefit of that player, put him in midfield? Um I love that little piece there because, you know, we do have coaches, I, I hate to say it, in the youth community that are strangleholding youth players simply for results and, you know, following the money trail and results mean uh, that's player development, which we all know is not true. Um, doesn't necessarily bear out that you're developing soccer players. Um, Jim Teachins, who I mentioned, is going to come on here. Uh, in the next segment, I was speaking to him t today and he said, you know, he's from St. Louis. So St. Louis, St. Louis University college system always has had great soccer history, St. Louis. And he's like, yeah, we haven't developed a national team player in a long, long time. Um, we're not. And then I thought about Houston and I'm like, yeah, we've, we haven't produced a U.S. national team player. What's going on? Dallas has. What's going on? What, what's, I have some theories on it. Um, you know, and in the case of the Dynamo, they want to produce players and get things turned around so that they can get them into the first team, provide important playing moments and quality, um, because once you move on from the academy and sign a contract, it, it's a nice cap relief for you because you don't have to pay a lot of money. And then these players can contribute it and ultimately you can sell them and make money. So that's an area they certainly want to improve. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to contemplate with the amount of people playing the game here. Why is there not a U.S. national team player out of Houston? If you think about it. Had a lot of pros, no question. Had a lot of youth internationals, no question. 713-780-3776. So on to player development. Here's soundtrack number 15. This is Johan Cruyff. When we were young, we could play the street. You can't play in the street anymore. But a lot of times with small children, I was playing in the parking lot. 
So what does that mean? It means that the surface is, uh, is bad. When you fall down, it hurts. So you try to learn not to fall down. Um, for small players, they quickly understand they've got to be technically much better than the other because if he's too slow, the big one will hit him over and he will be hurt. Of course, we had a lot of complaints of the mothers. Said, well, my child fall down. Well, the game of football is not to fall down. I mean, you mustn't fall down. So, or you've got to organize it one way or the other. So I always think that, um, that um, these sort of things help you to think the problem today is a lot of coaches are thinking for them. I always think that put a problem there and think about it. Try to do something or try to... And as soon as you think or as soon as you do something you're not capable of or you, or you don't know, you're getting better. It's like you're right-footed, you learn to shoot with your left foot. Of course you make a mistake, but as soon as you control it, you learn a lot. If your right foot is good, you never be better. So Johan Cruyff there is, uh, in a lot of ways, a large portion of that was talking about the importance of environment being the teacher, right? You might be playing on Macadam. We used to play in New Jersey. We'd shovel the snow. There'd be snow banks in the high school parking lot, and it would be very icy. And you couldn't, you couldn't fully sprint, okay, or you would break your tail, right? Um so you kind of had to tread lightly. And, you know, unfortunately, it didn't help me enough technically. It could have. I ended up being a marking back. But, um, you know, different environments, dirt fields, rocky fields. Uh, we shelter our players from this now. And, and the environment changes it. When I was running uh, and involved with the Hurricanes Youth Soccer Club, I very quickly realized that just coaching alone – was not going to help me develop these young soccer players. So I asked myself the question, what is it I'm going to be able to do in order to enhance their soccer experience um, from the standpoint of passion, to help them become better players, to challenge them, to get them to think for themselves. So I had two things. I took my best players, whether they were 15 years old or and put them in a men's league team. And I got into the Houston Football Association. I was very glad that they would let us in uh, back then. Made a huge difference. Because now they're walking on the field, they're looking at men, right? They're looking at men. There's a whole different dynamic than walking across and looking at kids your own age. Whole different dynamic. I actually did that with, also when I was phasing out of coaching, I took a club in Bear Creek, Bear Creek United for Carlos Lesson. I took his team that was a very good team, had Arturo Alvarez on it. And we put them in a men's league. And I think they got smoked the very first game, couldn't get the ball. They were all upset. So the environment teaches. And then the other thing, we used to load people, uh, two teams on buses down to Monterey, Mexico. And we took them uh, to Monterey, played before some of the big Rayados games in the Mexican league. And then we also went down uh, with the help of Efrain Flores and a man in Houston named Eduardo Beltramini, a big promoter friend of mine. Uh, we got to go down to Atlas, who at the time, uh, under Ricardo Lavolpe, had a lot of the best young talent. Oswaldo Sanchez. Um, who else did they have at that time? Rafa Marquez, um, my producer Guillermo's favorite. So uh, environment uh, has a lot, a lot to do with it. All right. Um, so let me be your love doctor for a moment. That's probably not a good idea, right? Yeah, no. Um but loyalty is an amazing aphrodisiac as we talk on Valentine's Day, right? It's an amazing aphrodisiac. It's important in relationships. So let's look at a few of the most loyal footballers in the world today. Uh, and this comes from the research company CIES. All right. Now check this out for loyalty. Because in a day and age of agents and chasing the money and, and transfer fees... You've got Igor Akinev of CSKA Moscow, who's been the goalkeeper there for 21 years. Okay, that's a good start. Thomas Muller, who today started for Bayern in the loss to Lazio, 16 years at Bayern. Gotta love this. Tony Jansky at Muchengladbach, 16 years. Manuel Neuer today, who started for Bayern. 
13 years at Bayern. Nacho, Real Madrid, 13 and a half years. One for producer Guillermo, who's unabashedly Barcelona. Sergio Roberto, 13.5 years. And there was a whole list. Marco Royce, Dortmund, 12. And I'm sure there's some undocumented guys that have been playing in some of the Nordic countries and places forever. But, you know, that's... That's a dying uh, sort of art, right? Remember Paolo Maldini? Whole career at AC Milan. Wow. What Francesco Totti. Totti at Roma. You can't have break music on Valentine's Day without the king. Just listen to the Elvis voice. I think your Valentine, Guillermo, is probably uh, the sport of soccer. Right? Houston Dynamo, Nelson Quinones, sadly out for the season. Hector Herrera, not sure what the injury update is on him. Preseason match at Orlando today. Dash hire a new coach, Fran Alonso. Celtic, back-to-back Scottish Cups and League Cups. This challenge will be the new league, the NWSL. Um, has quite a pedigree. Has worked under a number of different coaches at Southampton. Taylor Maples, you remember, was a Dynamo uh, Two product center back. On to New Mexico United to play for former Houston area and Major League Soccer player Eric Quill. That's an interesting one. Probably didn't see the pathway to being a starter in MLS here with a with a lot of guys at the center back position, including Ethan Bartlow and Sviatchenko. So, uh, New Mexico United in the USL. All right, uh, Jim Teachins. Uh, you're not going to want to miss this. Credible resume as a soccer player was one of the most talented U.S. goalkeepers. Uh, he has a new book called Saves. Um, this book encourages others and provides hope and the strength to keep going forward. Um, Teachins has had two heart transplants, a kidney transplant, cancer twice, pneumonia more than a dozen times a peripheral artery disease that has already led to the amputation of one of his toes. You are not going to believe his attitude and story. Jim Teachins is up next, and it's all brought to you by John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. DaspitLaw.com, 713-CALL-NOW. John and his firm, personal injury attorneys, they will handle your case, whether it's car, boat, motorcycle. DaspitLaw.com. This is Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Brought to you by the Daspit Law Firm. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Glenn Davis. All right, welcome back to Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5 as we roll on here. Final segment of the night here. I just want to remind you, Danish Inspiration's Modern Contemporary Furniture, Best in Modern Contemporary Furniture, presented by Jan and Yannick Christensen. Uh, My house is full of their product. In fact, the... Stressless lounge chair. I got a huge L-shaped couch. Beautiful leather chairs for uh, the Marble Kitchen Island. It's DanishInspirations.com. MLS season getting close to starting here soon. Everybody's getting ready for that as uh, this is London Beat. I've been thinking about you. All right. So uh, I set up Jim Teachin's, uh, and I told you about his resume. College All-American goalkeeper, youth national team. Uh, fantastic goalkeeper coming out of the St. Louis area at a time where there were a lot of very, very good goalkeepers. He was one that was always mentioned. I remembered Hall of Famer, um, but uh, he has had some incredible things to overcome in life. He's got a new book out. It's called Saves. Um, it's uh, I think it's out on Amazon now. We'll tell we'll talk to Jim about that. But this is a book that encourages others. Um, and provides hope and strength. And as he said to me today when we were talking on the phone, um, it's not necessarily uh, a soccer book, but it is incredibly inspiring. Um, and uh, we bring Jim on right now. Jim, thanks for uh, coming on the show tonight. We appreciate it. Hey, Glenn, how you doing? Good to talk to you again. Uh, first of all, I love your name, Soccer Matters. Uh, <laughs> I think when you look back at our careers, I know soccer started mattering for me when I was six years old. And I'm guessing it's probably the same for you. And it's mattered ever since, so great name for the show. Yeah, no, it it, it, it did. And um, what I want to just remind people out there real quick here is, so 
When I moved to Houston in 84, we had this team, the Houston Dynamos. It was the USL, outdoor soccer. Uh, they were trying to put a league together. There was a team, the Fort Lauderdale Suns. So we got into the final. It was a great, grueling three-game series. And the goalkeeper for the Fort Lauderdale Sun was a guy named Jim Tejans. And I had remembered him when he was younger because there was talk around the country about him and David Bursich, another St. Louis guy who played for the Cosmos. And, uh, well, we ultimately lost in a shootout down in Fort Lauderdale. And, Jim, you know, Lockhart Stadium, which is now where Inter-Miami plays, looked a little different back then. Oh, my God. But I tell you what, it was good to see it. Um, I even texted my friend who was the trainer for the Sun, and I told him that well, any minute I was expecting him to run out of the field to take care of a player who was down. But uh, the only difference at the stadium, well, it, it, they built onto it, obviously. But now it runs... Uh, Let's see, it runs south and south. It used to run east and west with the gold. Now it runs north and south. So they did change it, but it was really cool to see that and then think of some of the players that really played on those on those grounds. And you mentioned one this afternoon, a national team player for Scotland, Asa Hartford, and the list goes on and on. But it was, it was kind of cool to think of the guys that actually graced those grounds. Yeah, it was a, it was a great time period, and it was a time period where the priority – as you mentioned, was the game because uh, nobody was getting rich back then. That's for sure. No. But uh, you were an outstanding goalkeeper. You guys won the title that day, and uh, we still think about it down here. Uh, me and some of my buddies, and a few people come up every once in a while and remind about soccer in the '80s, which we played in a high school stadium as a home field. So, uh, right, right. I remember us losing that first game in the high school stadium, and I remember giving up a goal that I probably shouldn't have gave up, kind of floated over my head. And I was taking a good look at it, but I didn't move for it. But uh, then we moved on to Fort Lauderdale, and, you know, that was a tough series as well. And I actually think you guys went ahead in the game one and nothing. And I think we tied it up. But, yeah, I mean, it was low-scoring game, intense, some good players, and you know, really good games to play and fun games to play. And, hey, let me ask a quick question. Um, did you take a shootout? I wish you didn't ask me that, Jim. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to full disclosure. I had a fractured foot, so I could only okay. run straight ahead without being in pain. And of course, okay. you guys got Kabias out there, so I was trying to make sure I didn't have to turn. So I tried uh -huh. to keep everything in front of me, but I took one of the later ones because it was fractured, and I shot wide. Got it. Um, you know what? Oh, that hurts my feelings. If it's the one I, if it's the one I think it is, you hit a sizzler. Did it, did it just barely go wide? It just was wide by about a yard, I think. I hit it hard. Okay. I, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, I, I remember someone hit one hard that just barely got no. wide. And I don't know if it was that one or not, but I did get a finger fingertip to it. But you mentioned Kubias again. You know, I was kind of blessed in my career to play with some of those guys. He played only home games at that time, but that's right. You know, a lot of people didn't know him. But at one point in time, he was in the top three goal scorers in the World Cup. He had ten goals for Peru, but just an unbelievable player. And you know what I found, and I'm sure you found the same as over the years. Just a great guy. You know, great players, great guy. Yeah, oh, for sure. un unbelievable. And you know, even though these guys in some cases were older, um, it was such a privilege to be on the field with them. The ace of Hartford's him. Um, Dave Watson, who was a captain of England, playing yeah. in front of you, man. Yeah. That must have been some experience, too. Oh, that was, you know, because I, I just recently gone back when I was working on the book to see what national team players that I played with, and I think my number was eight or nine. You know, the next season when the uh, season actually folded? Yeah. Uh, Niskins Nies Nies played on, on the team for uh, until the season folded, but... I just remember how hard the guy trained. But, yeah, I mean, it was a privilege. I remember my first training ever down there uh, when I was in goal for the first time ever. Gerd Mueller was my sweeper in front of me. Jeez. And here I am, this 20-year-old kid, Gerd sweeping, and I'm yelling, kind of giving him instructions things. But just it's just un unbelievable how things come together. And if you were like me, I grew up wearing Gerd, M Gerd Mueller gold shoes with yep. the gold stripes on them. You know, and next thing you know, he's in front of you sweeping. Un unbelievable. But look, I want to get to you, and I want to get to your story and your book. Um, you got a new book out called Saves, but I, I just want to let you set the table with, and I'm just going to get you right into this, uh, the challenges okay. that you and your family and you personally have had, um, 
you know, physically and with health? Yeah, so so my, my family was really, started with my father, was affected by something that's known nowadays as idiopathic cardiomyopathy. And it's really a basic term for meaning sick heart. Your heart gets very sick. And in the case of cardiomyopathy, what happens is it, is it gets sicker and sicker, it swells. And it sends your, your heart rhythms into irregular beats that can cause sudden death. So my father passed away. I was 21, years, 21 months old at the time. He was 32 years old. Then my sister passed away. She was 32, and she was in the Navy, and she passed away from idiopathic cardiomyopathy. She was just found in her, uh, in her apartment because, again, it's those sudden, sudden bad beats that cause instant cardiac death. And there's been athletes that had it. You, you know, remember Hank Gathers and Reggie Lewis, guys like that, it's happened to on the court. Um, so that was the, that was the bad thing about this disease. It, your heart got into the bad rhythms, and those rhythms could take your life at any part, at any point. So after my sister passed away, I kind of expected, you know, knew that like, high likelihood something was going to happen to me. So when it hit me at 32 or really 31, I was prepared for it. And mentally, I've been preparing, you know, since my sister passed in 1989, mentally I've been preparing myself for the battle. So it wasn't like it was not unexpected. And I always felt, you know, same with sports, right? If you're out there and you have a plan, you have a good chance of succeeding. And, you know, I felt if the doctors did their job, I would jump in at that point and do my job. And I was still pretty young. So, you know, I think my athletic background helped me a ton. So I had my first transplant in July of 1992, July of 1992. And that lasted until December, I'm sorry, that lasted until basically 2018. It was probably going downhill a little bit before that, but I needed a new heart transplant in, in August of, two, uh, August of, what was it, 2000 and, uh I'm, oh, 2018. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. And what had happened over the years with your heart medication, you're taking heart medication that damages your kidneys. And at that time, people weren't supposed to live as long as they had lived. So they figured that the, the kidneys wouldn't be damaged because you wouldn't be living an additional 26 years. But what they found now, that people are living a lot longer, so they've got to find new medicines that don't damage your kidneys. So at the time when I needed my second heart transplant, I also needed a kidney transplant, um, which I got at the same time. And, you know, I've been very fortunate both times. My first transplant came from a 16-year-old young man from Tennessee, very strong. So with an athletic background, I got a great heart. And then uh, in 2018, I received the heart and the kidney from a Missouri National Guard Combat Medic, Missouri National Guard Combat Medic. Wow. He was 23 years old. He was a picture of health. And unfortunately, he had taken his own life. Um, it, it's interesting that the combat medics, their motto was, we serve so others can live. We serve so others can live. So That's even nice. in his passing, he was serving so someone else could live. So pretty amazing story. And I've got to meet his mom several times, and she's been able to hear his heartbeat inside my body, which actually is part of the book, and you can read about that in the book. But that was a special moment. And then having the heart at that time of some that was 23 years old, I actually recovered quicker at 58 years old than I did at 32 years old when I received my first heart. So, you know, I've been, I've been blessed. And, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit of this afternoon about um, this being a hereditary disease. Where I had two sisters that passed from it. My father passed from it. My sister has two kids. Both those kids are positive to the bad heart gene, positive, so that they have it. And, you know, my niece has already had two heart transplants as well, which would be my sister's daughter. Well, my two kids come along, and I have a son 28 and a daughter 26. My daughter went to play uh, volleyball at Florida State, so she had to have a pretty serious physical. She got one. Believe it or not, we got the results in about a week time, and um, she was negative to the bad heart sheet. I remember I was in sick at the time. I was in kidney dialysis working, uh, and I was in Cincinnati on the outskirts of Cincinnati in the dialysis chair when I got the word, and I just 
cried. I just oh. cried. Um, because now I knew that if she has kids, they will never get it either. And it's fine. I got the word of my son. And, you know, a lot of times people have asked me over the years, Jim, have you ever been angry, you know, God or anything like that? And, you know, I said, you know, I really have not. You know, I really never saw my mother angry um, when she lost her husband and she lost her, her, her daughter, her second daughter. And she was a, my mom was a role model for me. And she just always taught me, you know, to see the glass is half full as opposed to half empty. And every time I've had a challenge, I've just prepared for the fight. And I was an overachiever in soccer, so work came easy to me. So I just figured as long as I had a plan to do my job, that the doctors will do theirs, and I could take over from there. But uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, Glenn, but there have been, you know, there's been two cancers, one stage four. There's been a lot of blood flow issues to my feet. Um, in the last 30 months, I've probably had 15 different surgeries on my feet trying to open up blood flow from your waist down to your feet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a condition called peripheral artery disease, peripheral artery disease. And it tends to clog the arteries from your waist down. down. It's, it's actually a pandemic in the world, but most people don't know of it because it's not a branded a branded disease like American Cancer Society or leukemia and lymphoma. It's just now becoming prominent, and there is no cure for it. So when the doctors go in there to operate, they're dealing with a lot of issues because you've got arteries down there that are as thin as the bristle on a brush, as opposed to your, your, uh, you know, your bigger arteries in your heart that you can work easier with. But, again, blessed with um, a lot of great doctors, a lot of medical support, and, you know, they've brought me a long way. You know, it has played a little bit mentally on my mind, but, you know, I, I just figure if I do my part, you know, be patient, stick to my plan, things will work out. And, you know, it's, uh, I actually believe that the deal with my two kids and my granddaughter not having a bad heart condition to me, that's a miracle. Jim, let me, miracle. let me just break in because we only got two minutes left, and I want to make sure. Got it. Yeah. Um, this is Jim Teachin's um, incredible story here. The book is called Saves. It's on Amazon now. He's a very humble guy, but what, what I want you to also know out there is that uh, he's donating a couple dollars per book, and he's passing that on to other charitable uh, places, and he didn't really want to say that, but I decided I'm just going to jump in and do that. And, Jim, um, this is an amazing story. Um, just remind people, I think it's available on Amazon. It's called Saves. Um, where else can they get the book? So, yeah, Amazon right now, a hardback and a softback. Um, you know, softback is $16.99, hardback is $26.99. They can also go to my website. My website is www, and then this is all one word, inspire me. Why am I drawing a blank? Inspire me stories. Inspire me stories. dot com. All one word. It all runs together. Inspire me stories dot com. Um, you can purchase it off our website as well, um, and you'll see a lot of other things being added to the website. There's some nice stories on there. A little information that's in the book. But uh, I will tell you this: that uh, you will be inspired and you will be touched once you read the book. And a lot of people don't know. I worked with Raleigh Sporting Goods for 13 years. Did a lot of work with some great, great baseball player players. Was in the thick of things with Mark McGuire in 19. Uh, what was it when he had the Ozzie home run Smith, thing? Ken Griffey, yeah, Ozzie Smith. But yeah, um, so there's some Jim, we we, we got to go because we got a hard break. Um, I'm going to put this out there. We're going to re-air this interview. Great job tonight. It was a pleasure playing professionally against such a great goalkeeper. But more yeah. important. Um, your story, uh, the fight, the spirit, uh, all of this has been pretty remarkable here tonight. You certainly touched me listening to your story. Um, thanks for Thank coming you so on much, tonight. Glenn. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Glenn. All right, that's Have Jim. Have a good night, all right? Hope to see some artists from 713, all right? Yeah, definitely. Hey, Tim. All right, that's Jim Tejans, uh, and the book is called Saves. That's going to do it tonight here, Guillermo Lazo Romero. Just want to remind you here, YouTube Soccer Matters, go to our channels. Please subscribe. X and Instagram, at Glenn Davis Soccer, at Soccer Matters GD. Facebook, Soccer Matters, and Glenn Davis, glendavissoccer.com. Subscribe, like, follow, comment. 
Call in. These are data points. We need these engagements to keep us on the air. It's the best in soccer talk, self-proclaimed. Soccer Matters ESPN 97.5, as always, presented by the legendary Gaspit Law Firm.